Hello, my name is Laura Murray. I'm a forester at Winrock International, an international non-governmental organization based in the United States. Today, I'll present module 2.2 on monitoring activity data for forest remaining forests, including forest degradation, which is part of the Goffsey Gold World Bank FCPF training materials for red monitoring and reporting. Today, we'll explore definitions for forest degradation in relation to red, as well as methods for detecting and quantifying activity data under MRV systems for these degradation activities. During this lecture, I'll focus on the key messages of this module, skipping over slides occasionally that offer a lot of detail on subjects that you can review later. We'll begin with an introduction to key forest definition uh, concepts and definitions, uh, sorry, forest degradation concepts and definitions, and then we'll explore the main types of forest degradation. We'll then go over common approaches for assessing forest degradation activities. I won't go over the specific software for mapping forest degradation in any detail, but of course I encourage you to see the additional exercises offered as part of this module that do so. So forest degradation, uh, it results from activities that cause a persistent decline in carbon stocks, yet do not cause enough damage to change land use classification from forest to non-forest. While emissions from forest degradation may generally be lower in intensity, than those from deforestation, in aggregate, forest degradation activities have been shown to have a significant emissions impact. So it's important to include relevant degradation activities within RED programs uh, to ensure complete reporting. Forest degradation is caused by a range of activities with varying magnitudes of impact. So it's been uh, a bit of a challenge to develop a consistent definition and approach for monitoring. Many definitions exist in the scientific literature, but generally uh, degradation has been described as an anthropogenic intervention that results in changes to forest structure, composition, and function. Uh, degradation activities may lead to temporary or permanent changes in forest ecosystem services um, because of course forests can regrow and recover from disturbances, um, but over time, their ability to recover uh, may be diminished as a result of the degradation activities. Um, gradual, the gradual nature of, of the potential for recovery, as well as the need for consistent conservative accounting has resulted in the necessity to include the idea of persistence in the definition of forest degradation in the red context. So, um, the IPCC defined forest degradation in 2003 as um, a direct human-induced long-term loss persisting for X years or more, or at least Y percent of forest carbon stocks and forest values since time T and not qualifying as deforestation. This definition includes the, obviously, the important components of forest degradation, but clearly avoids describing specific thresholds for classification. This, of course, allows for a great deal of flexibility in um, how countries approach the definition. Um, the um, SBSTA um, also, in their definition, um, in direct reference to RED, had a lot of uh, flexibility in their definition that degradation leads to a loss of carbon stock within forests that remain forests. Um, for both definitions, of course, it was really important to, to have this uh, level of flexibility because the definition of a forest, um, as determined by the country, has an enormous impact on what would then be de considered degradation as the definition of forest clearly defines what um, is classified as forest and non-forest. Um, the definition also needs to consider what the dominus fo dominant forest degradation activities are, which could include logging, fuel wood collection, fire, and or grazing. Um, so forest degradation activities have varying impacts on carbon stocks over time. The predominant types of human-induced forest degradation include logging, forest fires, and fuel wood collection. As you can see in this diagram here, um, continuous logging 
as is seen in the zigzag line uh, towards the top. Um, uh, and fire, which is it, it pre presented sort of as steps in red, lower carbon stocks over time, whereas other activities like the shifting cultivation and plantation forestry generally follow a consistent and stable pattern of forest growth and harvest. So the activities that cause persistent um, yet gradual uh, depletion of forest carbon stocks are the activities we consider to be degradation activities. Um, the dominant forest degradation activities across the world, of course, are highly influenced by ecological and demographic factors. Uh, for example, fieldwood collection is dominant in Africa where alternative sources of household energy are less available and where there are large arid regions where vegetation has less capacity to regenerate quickly. Of course, we can see um, the comparative impact on fieldwood in Africa is very high in this bar chart, um, but much lower in Latin America and subtropical Asia where timber logging has a larger impact. Um, so the gradual, often subtle changes to forest carbon stocks associated with many forest degradation activities makes measurement and monitoring very challenging. Medium resolution remote sensing technology used to detect land use change like deforestation is less capable of accurately picking up the impact of subtle degradation activities. High resolution um, methods for specialized detection or specialized detection algorithms may be more adept at assessing forest degradation activities, but are generally really impractical in the red context because they're not only expensive, but they're also often technically complex to implement. So rather than adopting strictly remote, a re strictly remote sensing approach to measuring and monitoring all forest degradation within a program area, as is the case with deforestation, specific methods have been developed to quantify the impacts of specific degradation activities. So you can see in this table, um, an array of sources for activity data for specific forest degradation activities are listed. Um, for fuelwood collection and logging, you'll see that uh, non-spatial data sets could be used, such as national statistics and records. Um, on the other hand, with fire, uh, historical satellite-based data may be more appropriate. So the two categories of common sources for activity data and forest degradation are either field observations and surveys or remote sensing. Uh, so for field observations or surveys, um, including interviews or sample plots, um, those are good sources of data for some degradation activities like commercial forestry, where um, you could derive historical extraction rates from official records <clears throat> or household surveys could provide valuable information um, on how much fuel it is used. Um, remote sensing can be applied to directly infer where degradation is occurring by uh, detecting disturbances in canopy cover over time. Um, alternatively, <clears throat> remote sensing could be used to indirectly infer degradation through proximity to human infrastructure um, because these two variables have been shown to have a very direct correlation. Uh, remote sensing may be the most practical approach, as I said, to quantifying fires, um, but that is discussed a lot more in module 2.6. So I, that, uh, I'll direct you to review that module. Um, so for selective timber harvesting, um, which is the most significant driver of forest degradation in many countries, um, its impacts are really often are often very difficult to detect because the damage happens in really small, discrete areas and spread across large stretches of forest. So the damage caused by selective logging can be attributed to um, the felling and extraction of the log itself, as well as the associated infrastructure like roads and logging decks. There are two basic methodologies to estimate emissions from timber harvesting the first, um, which is uh, articulated not only um, in module 2.3 in further detail, but also um, the, uh, in the publication by Pearson et al., which you'll find in the references section at the end of this module, um, combines activity data sourced from records and national statistics on harvest volumes, as well as, the, as, well as potentially high resolution imagery with emission factors developed through a 
gain loss um, approach that accounts for emissions from timber extraction, as well as the gains that come through gap regrowth, and also considers the long-term storage of carbon in timber products. Um, the other approach uh, is more of a remote sensing approach using medium resolution imagery um, that uh, applies a stock change method for emission factors. So the first approach, um, as I said, is a gain loss approach and it's covered in a lot more detail in module 2.3, but in essence, it involves developing an emission factor that can be attributed to every cubic meter of timber extracted. So this emission factor is comprised of uh, a number of other um, emission factors. It's the sort of the summation of emissions that come from different categories, including um, uh, the extracted log itself, the carbon left at the logging site in the form of dead biomass in the roots and the crown of the tree, as well as the incidental damage to surrounding trees, that's called the logging damage factor, and the emission coming from uh, the emissions associated with forest clearing to establish logging infrastructure, such as roads, that would be the logging infrastructure factor. Um, all of these factors are developed through field data collection, um, and ultimately the emission factor representing all of these um, elements is paired with the activity data on forest volume heart, um, extracted to estimate total emissions. Uh, for logging infrastructure in particular, it can be assessed through direct measurement, through direct field assessment, um, looking at um, concession maps, etc. But high resolution imagery may also be useful in this ex assessing the extent of skid trails, roads, decks, in the concessions. Of course, again, please see module 2.3 for some more details on how the logging infrastructure factor is derived. Uh, but of course, using reported timber volumes as activity data may be cost effective, but may not be appropriate in all cases where official data either don't exist or don't fully reflect the actual volume of timber leaving the forest. Um, because of high rate of illegal logging. So in those cases, the use of high resolution imagery may be more appropriate as an independent method for estimating the area of logging damage. Here you see uh, high resolution aerial imagery captured through flying transects over concessions um, in order to get the area of logging damage. And in this slide, you'll see also the high resolution imagery approach um, paired with a cognition software to estimate the area of gaps, skid trails, and log landings. For fuel wood collection, um, a modeling approach can be applied to estimate what fraction of fuel wood use contr contributes to the persistence to persistent forest degradation. The wood fuel integrated supply demand overview mapping or wisdom approach combines national spatial and non-spatial data to map wood fuel supply and demand over a landscape. Identifying where the greatest fuel wood deficits are therefore allows for the development of an estimate of the proportion out of the total fuel wood collected that is not renewable, therefore contributing to persistent carbon stock depletion. The output of this methodology is an estimate of the fraction of non-renewable biomass. So if the total biomass used for fuel wood is known, emissions can simply be derived by converting the biomass to carbon dioxide. The remote sensing approaches uh, to derive activity data for degradation um, include both direct and indirect methods. The use of remote sensing methods for detecting activity data for degradation should of course be tailored, tailored to the specific degradation activities of concern and really needs to need to consider the intensity as well as spatial and temporal extent of the degradation activity. Direct methods can attempt to ascertain the extent of damage by assessing canopy damage and indirect methods can look at human infrastructure as a proxy for deforestation, sorry, degradation. 
As seen in this image here, um, forest degradation has a range of impacts on the forest canopy, which can be difficult to identify and delineate even with high resolution imagery. Um, it creates this mixture of environment um, here. So we see a little bit of selective logging. We see some logging road data, some regeneration. But all of that would be pretty difficult to delineate um, with the naked eye and systematically over a landscape. Medium spatial resolution imagery um, has a higher number of spectral bands, such as Landsat. Um, and it can be useful in some cases to map and monitor forest degradation that takes place over many years. Um, satellite platforms such as Landsat and Sentinel offer um, the advantage of long-term monitoring with consistent time series, as well as decades of research in their application to vegetation monitoring. Um, they're also widely available at low or no cost. So, of course, the drawbacks of median re resolution approaches are that they are not able to easily differentiate between some uh, natural and human disturbances, and they've also not been shown to be a strong predictor of forest biomass across forest types. Um, Here are some examples of uh, remote sensing methods and uh, sensors uh, that have been used or that could be used directly to detect selective logging and burning. Please uh, feel free to review in more detail on at your leisure. Uh, so here in this image, um, you see forest degradation activities um, across time. So between 1998 and 2003, um, at looking at what seems to be the same pixel, um, you can see that the forest degradation activities being depicted here are, are clearly connected, where over time, areas become increasingly degraded through multiple activities. So logging starts off in one area, see in 1998, and then is subject to burning, and then um, perhaps later is even deforested altogether for agriculture. So it's important that the types of drivers playing the most important uh, and prominent role in degradation in a red program area are considered in designing the methods for degradation monitoring um, to allow for consistent um, detection of the uh, degradation activity of interest. Again, here we see how difficult visual interpretation can be using direct methods. Defining the boundary around the degraded areas can be really highly subjective. And of course, in tropical climates, logged areas may recover rather quickly to the point where visual detection becomes nearly impossible. Of course, the long-term carbon stocks in the forest may well have been impacted. So um, it's important that despite the fact that it is visually difficult to um, pick up these areas get accounted for. So one way uh, to avoid the reliance on visual interpretation with medium to low resolution imagery is using um, spectral mixture analysis, or SMA. Uh, the reflectance of the imaged surface from various spectral wavelengths are evaluated to estimate the fraction of green vegetation or senescent vegetation, soil, shade, etc., which are all components that make up that can make up a single imaged pixel. Pixels that decrease their fraction of green vegetation over time can indicate possible degradation. So in other words, Pixels that show a high mixture of different types of, of um, signatures, a, a, high, a mixture of different spectral wavelengths, may indicate that um, there has been degradation in the area or in the pixel. Um, the next few slides go over SMA in a bit more detail. Um, I'm going to skip over them, but I do encourage you to look at the background material cited at the beginning of this module, as well as the references at the end, for more information on this approach. So where it's not possible 
or practical to apply direct approaches to activity data development for forest degradation activities, it may be appropriate to consider a more cost-effective indirect approach. So this method applies concepts developed to assess the world's intact forest landscape in the framework of the IPCC guidance and guidelines for reporting greenhouse gas emissions and removals from forest land. Under this indirect approach, forests are defined as either intact or non-intact based on stocking level. So intact forests are assumed to be fully stocked and undisturbed, whereas non-intact forests are assumed to have been subject to some form of forest degradation. These two categories are then objectively and systematically applied to all forest land use subcategories across the red, red program area or across the area of interest. <clears throat> and the um, classification of intact versus non-intact would be defined according to country specific parameters like uh, proximity to infrastructure or the presence of burned lands. Um, so again, here we go. Here's the, um, in this slide, we see the different uh, potential country specific definitions that could be applied for the definition of intact or non-intact land or forest areas, I should say. Um, so carbon emissions from forest degradation would then be divided by combining data on the difference in carbon stocks between the intact and non-intact forest, as well as the area loss of intact forest over the accounting period. Here's um, land use chain matri change matrix that would be um, applicable um, to demonstrate how land use conversions would be treated under this indirect approach. So any intact forest going to non-intact forest would be considered forest degradation. Um, the next few slides, again, are a lot more detail on this approach, um, which I encourage you to read at your own leisure. Um, and there's plenty of background material on this as well. There, um, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the software requirements again, but uh, the exercises offered as part of this module um, go over the um, IMG tools. And that concludes our lecture. I hope you now have a better understanding of forest degradation, its impacts, and how it can be detected and quantified under a RED program. You should now have a better comprehension of the importance of clearly defining forest degradation and the activities that drive it, as well as the limits of detecting um, degradation using earth observation, as well as the methodologies that can be applied to assess different types of forest degradation using field observations and surveys, as well as direct and indirect remote sensing approaches. Thank you for listening to this lecture of module 2.2 of the Goffsey Gold World Bank FCPF training materials for RED monitoring and reporting.